All right, well, thanks for coming on out, Wednesday Night Bible Study. We have been going through the book of Romans here now for about, uh, I think this is part six, might be part seven. Is it seven? It's part seven. I think it's part seven. I always mess that up, so as I've said last week, pay attention to the actual titles on the YouTubes and not actually my, uh, my what I say. Uh, so one of the things I want to share with you guys is we have a lot of we have a lot of viewers on the YouTube. People don't realize how popular it really is. We've had uh, uh, last month we had about 1,500 video views, and we're getting about uh, it was about 10,000, 11,000 minutes, which is approximately you know almost 800, 750, 800 hours of uh, you know videos being watched. So uh, we're not really advertising that. It's just simply us posting it, and then we do do some video responses. So what ends up happening is we'll, we'll, we'll do a response to a video. So if somebody talks about a specific subject, we'll attach our video to that subject. So it kind of works its way through the community as being that. And then we have some people that subscribe. We get about, uh, about a subscriber every other day. So that's also pretty crazy that, you know, where do these people come from? I don't know, but we get a lot of people subscribing and I'm getting random people commenting and talking and liking, you know, like 50 likes last month. I mean, that's a lot of people, that's random people just liking the videos or doing things. It doesn't tell you how many dislikes you have. So, uh, you know, it'd be uh, interesting to see. I mean, you could probably go through and pull it up. It just doesn't tell you that on the front screen, but we get people listening from all over. So I do, I do, uh, I, I thank those guys for listening and, and the ministry that we have, while it's not huge, we don't have a, a you know, a church with a million people in it, nor do you have a church even with, uh, you know, a hundred people in it. You know, our, our little Sun Coast has maybe what on a, on a busy Sunday, 50 people, you know, uh, I mean, I think the most I've ever seen is maybe 65 and that wasn't even on Easter or Christmas. That was just on a, on a random Sunday that everybody decided to show up. So it's good. I mean, I, I, I'm encouraged by that and I hope you guys are encouraged too. So we're going to continue through Romans chapter number nine. We'll start to get into a little bit of chapter 10 today and, and maybe even touch a little on 11 because all of these other pieces are going to kind of go together. So Romans 9, 10, and 11 are the parenthesis chapters of the book of Romans. They are discussing the nation of Israel, and Paul is explaining to you some information, some of which is part of the prophetic scriptures. So if you look at the, the chart up above here, you can see the prophetic scriptures uh, being listed there from, you know, from Moses and on forward. We have a lot of people who are discussing God's word, discussing topics of, of uh, the future and what God has in store, not only for the nation of Israel, but also for the world as a whole. So in Romans, uh, when Paul breaks this down here in chapter 9, it, it becomes, a, as we said, a problematic passage for a lot of people. And the reason being is because individuals, uh, they, they don't really wish to read all of it, or they have some preconceived notions about what needs to take place. And so without just, hey, take away all the preconceived notions you have, take away anything you think might be in it, and just sit there and, and spend time reading and studying the scripture, and you'll come, you'll come across with a, a, a lot more answers than you might think. And, and part of that is the way spiritual understanding works. It's, it's not about uh, being super smart. It's not about you going to seminary and, and, and getting a degree in Bible theology and uh, I remember one time a guy said, uh, this kid said he wanted to be a pastor, and, and they said, well, what seminary are you going to go to? And the kid was like, well, I don't know, I haven't made my mind up yet on that decision. And I remember my dad was talking too, and he's like, yeah, which, which seminary are you going to go to? And I'm thinking like, well, what's, is that really, the, is that the norm? Is that what happened? Did Paul say, okay, I appoint you a preacher, Timothy. Now make sure you go over to the Corinth Seminary or the Antioch Seminary. Well, no, he didn't do that. They didn't have that, so what they just did is they, they were taught and they communicated that in the Word. Paul talks about that in the book of Galatians. So we're going to go through Romans chapter number 9. We're going to get to... Um we're going to get kind of beginning into verse number 21, and we're going to go through 21 through 24, and then we'll get through the rest of this. So uh, let's uh, let's open in a word of prayer, and we'll get going. Dear God, we uh, we thank you for everybody that showed up today. We thank you for the truth that's in Romans 9 and the rest of your scriptures. Help us to understand this uh, by the Spirit, Lord, and that we'll have a, a great study here, and that we'll be uh, more edified and, and, and really uh, come, up, come away with something we can hold on to and, and focus on throughout the week. In your son's name we pray. Romans chapter 9, verse number 21, the Apostle Paul uh, is, is refuting some of the arguments that a man would have against these issues here in Romans 9. He says in verse number 21, he says, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? So the potter, who is that potter? Who, who is the potter who takes care of the potting? Well, that's, that's God. God's the potter. And so what he's telling you, he's saying, so God has the, God being the potter, he's got power over the clay. And so the question is, well, who is the clay? What is the clay? Well, what we have to do is we have to remember who the Apostle Paul is. 
So Paul, who's writing these scriptures, is a man who is very heavily trained in the Jews' religion, was he not? Yeah, he knew a lot about Judaism. He was deeply involved in it. He talked in, in Galatians that he profited in the Jews' religion above many as equals. He was more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of his fathers. He knew what Judaism was about. He knew about Moses. He knew about Abraham. He knew about Jacob. He knew about David. He knew about Solomon. He could tell you the scriptures of the prophets. He understood and studied those scriptures. But see, what he missed, because of the teaching he had, was what was going to take place with Jesus Christ. He didn't see the, the issue with Israel. He didn't see the revelation of the mystery until God revealed it to him there on the road to Damascus. And we've been studying that in, uh, in our Sunday morning sermons. <clears throat> so because Paul has this wealth of information that he's stored up, it wasn't that when he got saved and, and the Lord Jesus Christ came up to Saul and said, Hey, I forgive you of all your sins. I forgive you of the murder. I forgive you of, of, your, of your blasphemy. I forgive you of your, your, uh, your, your, your deceit, your lying, your hard-heartedness. I forgive you of all of that. By my grace, I'm going to save you, and not because of anything you do, because you're deserving of hell. And the Apostle Paul sits there and goes, wow, okay. Now, does he also say, Jesus Christ says, now all that stuff you learn, that's all to waste. That's nothing. You're just an idiot. You shouldn't even learn that stuff. No, what he does is he says, you know, now what you're able to do is take that information. It's kind of like what we do with the chart. It's putting the puzzle piece in. He's, you know, Christ is now explaining to them who he is what the Old Testament scriptures are about, what Israel's plan is, what its purpose is, how the mystery works, and all of a sudden, what's the Apostle Paul do with that old information? Does he say, well, that was all dumb and I couldn't use it at all? No, he actually now uses it. And that's what he does so often in these scriptures. You've got to remember that when he's writing Romans, it's not like he had to go back and say, well, I better go study all my scriptures again. He just had the light turned on, for lack of a better term. That's it. He had the light turned on. And when somebody turns on the light for you, I think many can relate. It helps, does it not? I mean, all of a sudden, you had some scripture, you had some Bible, you had some church, and then somebody turned the light on for you. Now, what causes the light to happen, and, and what is that light? Well, look, look with me at the book of 2 Corinthians. And, and in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, this is one of the biggest lights you can see in all the scripture. In 2 Corinthians, what, what Paul does is he's writing to the church at Corinth. It's his second time that he's writing a book that's going to be in the scriptures. He wrote other scriptures to the church of Corinth that didn't get included in the canon. But in, in chapter 4, he, he says the word therefore. And remember what we always say, if you see a word therefore, what do you got to ask yourself? What's it there for? Why is it there, therefore? Well, he goes back and he tells you about, about the ministry that you have. And he says in verse number 13, this is going to all correlate back in Romans 9 in just a second. But he says in verse number 13, uh, verse 12, he says, Seeing then that we have such great hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses. So when Moses wrote, did he use plainness of speech? No. So what is that going to tell you already? If you go back to what Moses wrote and you don't see what Paul wrote, what are you going to do? You're going to do this, put, which put a veil over his face. Meaning that you're not going to be able to see it the exact way that God wants you to see it unless you see what the Apostle Paul wrote. Because he's going to explain to you what the mystery is. He's going to explain to you what the, what, the, what the light is. And he says this, The children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. So what was abolished with Moses, we all know what Moses brought in. What's Moses most famous for? I mean, who's seen the Charleston Heston f film, right? With uh, uh, the, the Ten Commandments, right? Isn't that Charleston Heston? Right, I think so. That's his name. Am I right on that, Charleston Heston? Uh, so you know you've seen that you've seen that you've seen the, the 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 film, and we actually watched it just not too long ago. My wife was like, "Hey, I've never seen that." I'm like, "Oh, you've never seen that? You got to see it." I was surprised that some of the things weren't exactly as biblically accurate as the scripture says, but that's uh, that's that's to be you know that's to be uh, kind of assumed, and, and uh, I guess it's going to happen. It's par for the course. We just watched some of that Bible show too that was just on TV. I don't know if you all seen that as well. Similar kind of deal, like. Eh, Close, close, not exactly, uh, but they've already had 750,000 pre-orders for the DVD series. I saw that today on Facebook. Somebody had posted it. I'm like, wow. I'm like, uh, you know, they made a book about that? It's real good. It's real good. You guys should take a look at it sometime. Uh, either way, you know, most of the people are, are more interested in seeing the movie than reading the book. You know, but what is it always about? What is the people who say, oh, oh, I, I, I read the book? What typically do they know more about? They know way more about what's going on. The people who watch the movie, oh, that movie was really good. I mean, you can see like the Twilight series. I've never seen it. Harry Potter, same deal. People will say, it's nothing like the book. I mean, even like Chronicles of Narnia or whatever you're going to pick, they make adaptations 
from the books and they don't put all the stuff in there because, hey, you only got a two hour window, maybe a three hour if you're doing Lord of the Rings style and, and that's all you're going to get in there. But when you read the book, what can you do? You can close it and you can open it. You can close it and open it. You can start whenever you want. You can go as slow as you want. Whereas when you're watching a movie, what do you have to do? You're at the, you're at the, the, the will and whim of the person that's presenting that movie to you and it might go really fast. You don't have an opportunity. So in, in chapter uh, three, verse number 13, the, when Moses is writing, he doesn't use the great plainness of speech. And there's a reason behind that because the law had a purpose that God wanted to fully work out with the nation of Israel. And if you look at what he says, he says that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Now notice what it says is abolished, right? What is abolished? What was taken care of? What was destroyed? Well, the law was, was it not? It was. So go back for me just a second and, and look at verse number uh, six. Paul writes and says, uh, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament? And he says, you know, this isn't, this isn't like the Old Testament. The Testament of Moses and what he gave to you is not the New Testament. He says, not of the letter. That's what Moses wrote down. He had a letter he wrote down in, in paper exactly what the law was. And it was to a T and everybody knew what the law was. And he says, but of the spirit. And he gives you an understanding here. He says, for the letter, that's the law, the letter killeth. Now, I want to make sure it's really clear to you that the letter never changes. The letter will always kill. Always. Every single time, it always kills. I don't care how hard you try to finagle it into saying, no, the, the letter is going to help me. The letter is going to make me better. No, it's not. It never will. It will always do what it says right here. The letter killeth. Now, what gives you life, though? He says, the spirit giveth life. So now what you're going to come from an understanding is, is that the letter is not spirit and the spirit's not the letter. Now go to verse number seven. Now he says this letter that killeth, he's going to call it something. He's going to call it the ministration of death. Wow. It's interesting. Well, if you just read through the law, what you would come to conclude is that there's a lot of death going on in that law. And there's a lot of punishments in that law. And, and when you compare yourself to the law, we often today will go, ah, well, we, 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 the people who try to keep the law will say, oh, yeah, I'm keeping law. I'm doing a really good job doing it. And I say, but really, are you? You know, what do you know about the law? Well, I've seen Charleston Heston's film, The Ten Commandments. Well, that's great. But you know how many other commandments there are? Almost 700. Do you know any of those other ones? No. Well, see, what happens is even though the law is abolished, let's put it this way. The law is abolished, but it still serves a purpose. It's abolished for you only when you're in Christ. And so for the nation of Israel, we're going to see today that they, they, they tried to seek after that law. They seeked and sought to try to do it. But what did God say? God said, you did it the wrong way. Why? Well, keep reading here. He says, but if the ministration of death, it's written and it's engraven in stones. All right. Think about the Charleston Heston film, right? What does he do? He puts the, puts the stones. They write down the Ten Commandments in there. He says, was glorious. Was it not glorious? Was it not an amazing event? Yes. And Moses', Moses face shone. He says, so that the children of Israel could what? Not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, right? Which glory was to be done away. He says, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit, that's what we're doing today while we look at the scriptures and we, and we, we, ex we explain to you what's happening back there. I mean, how many people will, will try to you know, say, well, why did, why did they do these animal sacrifices? Uh, why was there a need for a priest back there? Uh, what's a burnt offering? You know, like, oh, well, that's interesting. What's circumcision all about? I, I don't know. I mean, do you have answers for those questions? If somebody were to ask you today, well, why would, why would they do something like that? Like cutting off the foreskin. I mean, that just sounds absolutely bizarre that somebody would do something like that. What was the purpose of that? Well, God had a purpose in that, and he, he explains it quite clear. And it's pretty interesting because part of what he's showing you in here, he's saying it's all about the flesh. He's trying to give you this allegory and this analogy to give you a picture. And he says in verse number uh, 9, he says, For the ministration of condemnation be glory. It is glory. It's God's glory. He says, Much more doth the ministration of, what's he call it? Righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that it excelleth. So he's saying that the, the glory that's in the law isn't even can be remotely compared to the glory that comes through the spirit that comes from actual life. Now look what he says in verse number 12. Seeing then 
that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. What we talk about in Bible study is not hieroglyphics. We're not sitting here studying the Greek and the Hebrew and the Latin and the Aramaic, and we're, we're spending our time you know, carefully breaking down every word and tittle of the thing. And No, we're not doing that. Why? Well, we have great plainness of speech now. There's no need to. Nor are we going back to the Old Testament saying, I wonder what this really means. In tr we can understand all that. We can go back and have an understanding about each piece of scripture if we spend the time to do so. Now, what's it going to require? Well, it's not going to require you to go and watch the Robert, uh, what's the chick's name? Uh, Roma Downey. Roma Downey. Isn't that her name? The Touched by an Angel chick? Isn't that her? She was from, she did the Bible series. And so it's not like you watch a Roma Downey show on the Bible. And you're going to go, oh, great, I know everything about the Bible now. I'm just, I'm great, I'm dandy, I'm ready to go talk about the Bible now. Well, no, I mean, not really at all. What we have to do is we're going to explain with plaintiffs of speech, using the scripture, things that God wants you to understand and know. So when you read in verse number 13, and he says, we're not going to do it as Moses. So the plaintiffs of speech that we have is not the same thing that Moses had. So when you read the Old Testament, there's a purpose in there. But you're not going to get it from just reading in isolation those books, from reading Exodus, reading Numbers, reading Deuteronomy, reading Leviticus. You'll get real bored real quick, and you'll be like, I don't understand any of this. Well, good, because it's not talking about you at all. So let's understand that and read verse number 14. He's going to tell you about the nation of Israel, what happens to them. Look what he says. He said, their minds were blinded. Who blinds them? Well, we'll read in a second that Satan does that. They're blinded for until this day. Paul's saying up until the present day, he writes this text. He says, you know what? When they read these Old Testament scriptures, what are they doing? He says, the veil is untaken away. They don't see things plain. When they read the Old Testament, they don't get it. They don't understand it. They think they know what they're talking about, but they've only seen the movie and they've never read the book. So what God wants you to do is go back and read the book and say, hey, I mean, don't you think you owe it to yourself to read the book? It's the best-selling book ever, ever. Beats Harry Potter, beats Twilight, more copies sold of this book. Why? Why? Why is it so important? Why is it so, why is it so interesting? Why do we put our hand on it when you go to court and you swear and you say, I, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth. I just did it the other day. I went to court and uh, you put up your hand. They say they don't have a Bible now, but you, some, some courts do. But I, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but truth, so help me God. Well, who's this God guy? Why do I care about him? In court, they still say that. That's weird. I mean, it's not weird to me. I understand why. The whole world is demonstrating the fact that there's a creator. You know, at the same point in time, they're trying to get all mad to take the Ten Commandments out of the court system. But I'm going, but we're trying to, we're convicting people of robbery. And we're convicting people of murder. But that's what it says not to do. So what's the problem? Well, that's God ordained. Well, what's it matter? You tell me I have to swear by the truth, nothing but the truth, tell me God, and now I can't have God, but I can have God in this part and God not in that part. Does that make any sense? It doesn't. It's two-faced in this. Because what ends up happening is the conviction that comes from, from having God in something, what's it do? It starts stimulating thought, and people are going like, well, I don't like this God thing. It, it, it bothers me. It makes me feel weird. I, I just don't like it. Well, everybody knows that there's a God. So regardless of if you, if you say, I don't believe there's a God, I think it's fooey nonsense. Well, that's interesting, because how many times have you ever said, oh, my God, before? I have friends that are atheists, and they'll say, oh, my God, oh, my God. I'm like, whoa, 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 chill out, chill out. The other day, the, uh, when I was at the temple, one of the girls said something. She said, like, uh, <laughs> she said something like, oh, my Jesus, or something like that. And Nate said, Nate goes, he's not your Jesus, he's my Jesus. But he's your Jesus, too, if you, if you want him to be. And the lady kind of looked at him, and he's like, she's like, what are you talking about? So, it, pretty funny. But if you keep reading through here, he's got, uh, he, he writes this out there. He says, but their minds were blinded. He says, for until this day remaineth the same veil. What's a veil? It's something that covers the face, does it not? You go to a wedding and the, and the bride wears the veil to cover her face until the time where they pull it up and you get the kiss. Right? And he says what? The veil it's still there. It's untaken away in the what? In the reading of the Old Testament. So these guys are telling you, yeah, they certainly do read the Old Testament. Israel's reading the Old Testament, but what's the problem with it? Their veil's not taken away. They read it and they don't see what? He says, which veil is done away in Christ. So what's that going to tell you? The Old Testament, what Moses wrote about, what David wrote about, what everybody else, all the scriptures, the prophets, all they're talking about is Jesus Christ concealed. That's what it is. It's all talking about Christ. So you scripture after scripture after scripture. Everything points to this Savior, points to this Redeemer, points to Jesus Christ. 
What's also really funny too is is uh, they want to get away with Jesus in the courtroom. We're God in the courtroom, and they want to take away the Ten Commandments. But I'm like, but we're gonna. What's what's the year today? Oh, it's courts in session this uh, you know thirteenth uh, day of May two thousand thirteen A.D. What does that mean in the year of our Lord? Well, who's Lord? What Lord? What is that all about? Uh, hurry up, get that out of here. We're not going to, they can't do that. What are they going to do? They're going to turn around all of time, change all of time now. Sorry, we're getting rid of AD. We're not going to do that either. You follow me how it's so, it's so asinine that the world thinks that they're going to get rid of God, but they can't. It's in it. It's in every piece of your life. It's in every piece of your world. And even if you try to deny his existence, you're going to look around and you're going to go, there's no way. I mean, sit there and contemplate life and death and mortality for just a moment when you go to sleep tonight. Just sit there and think about it. Just go, wow. I breathe. I don't really know. I just, just happens. And I have to have a certain mixture of oxygen, nitrogen, and the rest of the gases in order to breathe. I have to have a certain temperature, and if I get any hotter, I'll die, and if I get any colder, I die. My skin is able to absorb things, and you, just, you think about every piece of your life and every piece of the world, and people go, well, how could you deny there's a God? Well, they say they're a free thinker. I say you're not a free thinker. Why? They're not a free thinker because look at verse number 14 reads, but their minds were blinded. How does it get blinded? What takes place? Where's the blinding comes from? They say, I'm not blind. You're the one that's blind. You're the one that's such a hard-headed, bigoted person, Jason. Well, no, hold on. What do we, how am I bigoted? When we say, well, you just, you're not a free thinker. That's, a, that's the new atheist movement. The new atheist is called a free thinker. They're not going to call themselves atheist. They're going to call, you know, no theist. You know, we're monotheistic. We believe in one God. They're atheists, no God. So when you, when you understand that their minds are actually being worked on in a specific way by the course of this world. Look what he writes in verse number uh, 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 15. He says, But even unto this day, when Moses has read, the veil is upon their heart. Is it really upon their heart? Well, yes, we'll keep reading. We'll see what happens. Verse number 16. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. So the it there, I believe, is we're going to see is, is talking about the nation of Israel. And he says in verse number 17, Now the Lord is that spirit, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And he says, this is how we see. Anybody that's in the body of Christ that reads their scriptures and studies them rightly divided, understands dispensational truth, says this, we all with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. We see exactly what God's glory is. We don't just see it by the, by the law. We see it by the truth of who Paul is. We see it by the truth of grace and what God has in store for us. And he says, we're changing the same image from glory to glory, even as the spirit of the Lord. Now, when Paul explains it, he says, now look, now that you understand that and what you see, what should you tell people that don't see? He says, you should tell people this. He says, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, what's the ministry? He says, what do you know that other people don't know? Well, you, have, you, you read the book. You didn't just see the movie. I don't think anybody out there today, you're going to be able to say, hey, do you know who Jesus Christ is? I mean, I think most people are going to say, yeah, they've heard of Jesus Christ, right? Is there people going to say, no, I've never heard of Jesus. No idea who that guy is, especially in America. No. I mean, one nation under God, indivisible. Uh-oh, whoops, whoops, better get him out of there again. Hurry up, get him gone. You follow me how just crazy it is to try to do it? It's just not going to work. And if you've ever been to Rome or if you've ever been to like Italy or Florence or any of those places, good luck getting God out of there. I mean, everything, everywhere you turn, there's some image of God. There's some image of the Bible. There's some picture or, or discussion of creation and, 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 uh, and, and, and Jesus. But he says, therefore, seeing we have a ministry. This is what's important. This is a ministry. It's not just a dogma. It's a ministry. It's to show the glory of Christ through the gospel. That's really the real purpose of the law, too. It's to show you the redemption from it. He says, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Now look what he says in verse number two. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God. That would be your Bible deceitfully. Are there people that handle the word of God deceitfully on a regular basis? Yes. Yes, all day long. I can, I can point you in the direction of a million people who do not with a clear conscience take the word of God. Scott emailed me a guy today. It's just crazy. It's just a crazy. And you go, hold on. How do you, how do you get to that position? Well, I'm going to tell you that the way that Satan operates and the way that he works is that way. He wants to be crafty. He has to be deceitful. He's called that great deceiver in Revelation 12 verse 9. 
He says, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but what, we, what we should we do? We should take the truth, as he says here, it's manifestation, to make it manifest, to declare it, to show it openly, to put it out there on display. We say, here's the truth. That's another common hard problem for the world to face. People don't like truth. Truth hurts, doesn't it? And they always say that. Truth hurts. Sometimes it's better to tell a lie. I've heard that one too. Well, well no. The problem that I see is that, that truth, or what we would call absolute truth, is evident. It's there. And you know how we know that there's absolute truth? I've heard it said before. Some, one person told me, they said, there's no such thing as absolute truth. I said, you just proved my point. What do you mean? How are you going to tell me there's no such thing as absolute truth when that statement is an absolute truth? You follow me? If you tell me there's no absolute truth, you just told me there's absolute truth. Oh, good point. Well, what is the what is the common denominator for truth? You know, I, one of the guys that I, I think is really interesting is C.S. Lewis being an atheist and coming to the point where he sat there and looked at looked at the issue of of morality and said, "Well, this proves there is a God because how else are we so moral?" I talk to a lot of atheist friends of mine. I say, "What is your what is your purpose in doing any good?" For you, if I were you and I didn't believe in a God, and I didn't believe in a judgment to come, and I didn't believe in righteousness, why would I care about doing good for anybody? Why would I care about good and evil and right and wrong? Well, that's because it's instilled in you. They'll say, well, it's society. And I say, well, keep thinking about that just for a little longer. How does that work? Society. Societal norms. Oh, it's just, it's just a, it's a, it's, it's instilled in you. It's, it's your behavior that's, that's molded as you grow up in the world. Well, that has to come from somewhere. Somebody had to say right. Somebody had to say wrong. You know what Paul says? He says that's built into you. There's nobody out there that's ever going to tell you. And my common example is nobody's going to tell you that if you picked up my little tiny 11-month-old, cutest can be a little baby, and you threw him on the ground, people say, what are you doing? They're like, well, I'm going to pull out a chainsaw. I'm going to cut him up into pieces. That's the most horrendous thing I've ever heard. Why would anybody do that? Everybody would say that's horrendous, would they not? Would anybody say that's not murder? No. Where does that come from? How do we know not to do that? How do we figure that out? Well, God explains that to you. God explains to you not only the world that, that, that operates in that way, that's what demonstrates to you the judgment that is to come. Do you not understand that? Do you not see that whenever you go and say, that guy did me wrong, he needs to go to jail. Think about the Boston Massacre. Praise God, we got him, we killed him. Think about it. We killed him. We got rid of him. He's dead. And then you go, well, are you guilty of death too? If you compare yourself to the scripture and look at what it says about what you've done, you ever hate somebody? You've committed murder. Ever lusted? You commit adultery. Wow. I don't think I like that. Well, that's okay. You don't have to like it. <laughs> it doesn't change the truth. The truth's hard to swallow, but the truth's good. And you always want to find the truth. But what you're going to find most of the time with people who open the scripture is what? What are they trying to do? Line that pocket. Get it nice and thick. Get lots of money, find a ways to uh, further their bank account, further their power, further their incentive of being a leader. And that's not truth. That's being deceitful. They're not looking to manifest the truth out there. They're not, as Paul says, you're commanding, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God, saying, use your conscience. You know what conscience is? It's with knowledge. Conscience, with knowledge. You're born with a conscience. And even when you're a little kid and you do something wrong, you go, oh man, my conscience is eating me up. It's eating me up inside. That's not the Holy Spirit, it's just your conscience. What is that? That's your own resolution of guilt that God gives to you and instills in every single person. There's three things that everybody knows. Number one, everybody knows that there's a God. Doesn't matter, read Romans chapter number one. Number two, everybody knows that there's right and everybody knows that there's wrong. And number three, everybody knows that there's a judgment to come. Doesn't matter. I don't care how, how hard you try to deny that, you know where there is. And part of the reason why the judgment issue is so important is because you sit there every day and you can watch Judge Judy and you can watch Judge Leroy Brown or whoever these guys are. You can watch all these guys on TV in, in sitting in a judgment seat, 
right? All day long, nobody will say, don't judge him. Only God can judge him. But we'll sit there and, and those shows make millions and millions and millions. You know what wealthy Judge Judy is? Go, go on look on Wikipedia. That lady is crazy wealthy. Crazy wealthy. People say, well, who watches that? Vast majority of Americans who are unemployed sitting at home during, you know, 12 o'clock television hour. I don't know. I don't I've never really seen it, but a handful of times on YouTube. But they like to see that. They like to see what's called justice. Don't, isn't everybody? That's what the whole Boston killing was about. Justice. It's just that what happened. We killed him. But you killed somebody. Yeah, but he killed three years. How many people? Three people? Right? He killed three. And he wounded 30 others or whatever. Yeah, he's worthy of death, is he? Well, what about you? What you have to understand is that that judgment, what that does, is it shows to you, Paul says, he says, Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For whosoever thou judgest, thou condemnest thyself, for thou doest the same. He says, you do the exact same things, you just don't understand it. Because you just think you've never actually pulled the trigger. Because you don't think you've actually ever planted the bomb. Because you don't think you've ever actually gone all the way through with it, just because you thought about it. I mean, I've been really angry with somebody to the point where I've been like, oh, I chopped that guy's head off. I want to deck him right in the face. You know, Christ says, Christ's like, God looks at the heart and he goes, look, you've seen Minority Report, right? Tom Cruise, Minority Report. What's he do? Whole issue is getting to the heart of the issue before it happens. We're going to see it before it happens. And what are we going to do? We're going to convict them on that. You can't do that. It's called a thought crime. You can't convict somebody for a thought crime. I can think all day long that I want to kill people. I'm thinking of all the people I want to kill. Guess what? Government doesn't know. But guess who does know? God knows. Hmm. And you know what? That's what the conscience issue is. You're born with that conscience. Paul says that your conscience also bearing witness. He says, inside of you, he says, else the mean excusing or else accusing one another. You accuse people all day. Judge Judy does. The court system does. Anybody ever been on a jury before? Somebody? No? And nobody here has been on a jury. One, two, three. A couple people have been on a jury before. You know, that's what it is. You're sitting on a jury pool to, to sit there and judge. You're sitting in judgment of somebody and what they're doing. But the latest statement is, hey, nobody can judge. But let me show you this here in verse 3. He says, but if our gospel, this is just good news. Paul says, look, we have a gospel. It's good news. We want to help people out. It's not about con condemning people. We want people to know what's going on. We're not going to hide this. We're going to do this openly. We're not just going to talk about it. We're going to live about it. That's why he says in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse number 1, he says, uh, verse number 3, he says, for as, uh, verse 2, I'm sorry, he says, you are an epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. People see you and they can read the scripture without ever opening and cracking their Bible because they see should see in the life of a believer Christ in you, the hope of glory. They shouldn't see the guy who's trying to line his pocket. They shouldn't see the guy who's having a, 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 an affair with the, the 16 year old Jack Schapp up there. And, you know, it, it, great. Hey, you know what? That stuff happens all the time. And it's a testament to the, the sinful nature of man and that nobody is outside of it. I don't care who you are, how high you are, how much the pinnacle you reach, you're still susceptible to sin. And that demonstrates the need for this gospel. And he says in verse number four, he says, in whom? Now note this. He says, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If somebody's lost, I was thinking about it the other day. I was like, you know, if you're out driving somewhere, and let's say you're, you're out in the middle of nowhere and you see somebody just walking. I mean, you're like, do you think they know where they are? Are they, are they lost out here? It's not a place people should be walking, you know? And you roll in the window and and maybe they didn't have the pride. You know, they had, they had too much pride. They didn't have the, the humility to say, hey, uh, I'm kind of lost. They didn't want to flag you down. They just felt stupid. But you stop because you're like, hey, hey, are you lost? And you know what? They go, dude, I have no idea where I'm at. And you're like, okay, yeah, yeah. If you go, if you go up the street, you know what? Just get in the car. I'll take you there, right? That's kind of what we do with the scripture and what we do with the gospel. We, we look around and we say, hey, look, are, are you lost? Do you know, where, you know where you're going in life? Do you really have a hope? You know what you're going to do when you die? Sit there in your bed and just contemplate it. Contemplate it before you go to bed one night. If you, if you haven't done it, just, just do it. Just think about it. Being like, it's pretty crazy. How many more times is my little heart going to go? Dun, 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 dun. How many times am I going to breathe? I don't know. You know I think about one of my buddies, uh, Justin, who had that, he had a like crazy skin cancer. I mean, he's doing great. That guy was like, he's a pretty big guy. 
And all of a sudden, next thing we know, what's going on? Skin cancer. And I'm like, dude, you're 30 years old. You got skin cancer? That's crazy. Yeah, it's in my neck. It should have, hopefully, just a little surgery. Next thing you know, he's getting half his face removed. You know? It's like, oh my gosh. I mean, three kids, you think he's probably going to say, oh, I want to live my life until I'm 70. I'm going to, you know? And we'll thank God that he's in remission right now. But you don't remember how long that can last. It could be tomorrow. You wake up and all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, sorry, it's all in your lymphatic system. Yeah, it's all actually in your bones. Nothing we can really do. Then what do you do? Think about that. You got to live your life for the next, what, six months, a year, however long they tell you to live. And you just know there's only a couple more days. But see, what the problem is, is with, with the reality of the truth, is that it's a hard truth to swallow. And that if you can just, if you can, if you can humbly say in verse 4, that the lost, these individuals are in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them. See, this isn't them being free thinkers. They think they're being free thinkers. You follow me? They think they're free thinkers. Oh, I'm a free thinker. No, actually, you're, you're following the course of this world. You're actually blinded. Your minds are blinded by the, by, by the God of this world. And then which what? Which believe not. That's the issue. They won't believe the word of God. I'm not interested in believing the, the, the word of God. Well, what happens when you do believe? Well, the second you believe, guess what happens? The light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, shines right unto you. You see it plain as day. You see it and you go, wow, that's pretty awesome. Just a little bit of faith, a little bit of belief. doesn't require you to walk down an aisle. doesn't require you to start you know, speaking in tongues or jumping up and down or doing barrel rolls. None of that. You don't have to do any of that stuff. Have a little faith and believe God's word, and he'll start to reveal it to you and start to show it to you. It all starts with the gospel, though, and the gospel is what? Verse 5. He says, I'm not here preaching Jason Tripp hour. This isn't Jason Tripp hour. We don't care about Jason Tripp. He says, we preach not ourselves, but Jesus, Christ Jesus, the Lord. See that? That's who we're preaching. We're preaching about Jesus. That's what we're here to preach about. And he says, and we're doing that, and it's not for, you know, ourselves, it's not for our sake, it's for yourselves. He says, in ourselves, your servants for Jesus' sake. We're trying to help you. And he says, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath what? Has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He says, I really want you guys to see this and understand this and get the issue of the glory of God, the darkness of this world, and the hope that you can have. I mean, is it, is it weird that I can say, I, Todd and I were talking about this, I said, you know what, Todd? I mean, I thought about how, how sad it would be, but I said, you know, if like my dad died, I don't, I don't think I'd be that sad. And he's like, yeah, I know. I kind of, I know what you mean. And I'm like, I just, I mean, I'd be sad that I, I lost him for a little bit, but he's not lost. You know, I won't see him for a little while, but he, he, he's in heaven and we know that and we have a hope and we can guarantee that. You can read right here in the scripture, go read through the rest of this chapter four and read chapter five and you'll see that you have a confidence. He says, I'm always confident. He says, I know that well, I'm at home in the body, you're absent from the Lord. But he says, I'm, I'm, I'm willing, I'm willing to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And that's hard, to, that's hard to get to an understanding of. You know, you'd be sad for a little bit, but you understand from a spiritual perspective, the truth of God's word. It's not a life of reformation, you know? It's not about if you cleaning yourself up and then maybe God will be happy with you and be, you know, okay, now, now you're acceptable to God. No, he makes you accepted in Christ. He puts you in there and he says, now you're accepted. Not because of anything you could do, because that law demonstrates over there that you couldn't do it. I don't care how hard you try, it will never work. It's, not, it's nothing to do with you putting on a probationary period. It's nothing with God trying to tell you, Okay, I'm going to lead you on and put the carrot out here. Okay, now get on the horse and start riding and see if you can get that carrot. You'll never reach it if you try yourself. See, what God's done is he did it all for you. He did it on the cross. He died for your sins. And he died for the nation of Israel's sins too in Romans chapter number 9. And it, and it got people kind of confused. And they didn't understand that. Look at verse chapter 9 verse 30 just for a second. Look what he says here in 9 verse 30. He says, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to the righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? Paul's getting upset here, or being upset, I should say, from the Israelites' perspective, to show the Israelite, like, hey, this isn't about you trying to keep the law. We just showed you that in, Rome, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 and 4. You got this veil. Look what he says, verse 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, not righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Is the law completely righteous? 
Of course it is. Don't murder. Don't steal. Thou shalt bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. All those things. Great things. All righteous things. But you know what? Paul says, and so does James. He says, Paul says, Cursed is the man which continueth not in all the book of the law to do them. The law is not a pick and choose approach. It's all or nothing. James says, what? You know what James says about the law? He says, I'm glad you didn't do this. And I'm glad you didn't do that. But you know what? If you offend it in one point, you break one of those laws before God, guess what? You broke the whole thing. You're guilty of the whole entire law. Because one right unrighteous act or a hundred unrighteous acts doesn't change the fact that you're unrighteous. Unrighteous is just you being lower than God. I have no problem with that. All mankind's on the same playing ground. Completely unrighteous. And you know what, what the, the gospel of grace does? It puts everybody on the same playing ground throughout all of eternity. Why? He says, because it's by grace. No more of works. So not a single person's going to get to heaven and say, hey, look what I did. That's why Paul says in Romans 3, he says, where is boasting then? If you don't get to boast. Why? He says it's excluded. He says, by what law? The law of works? Well, obviously not, because if it was a law of works, you could work all day. He says, by the law of faith. Look what he says here. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Why? Why? They were trying to do all these righteous things. Why didn't they get it? Look what he says. Because they sought it not by faith. The whole time they did it, they had no faith. They didn't believe who God was. They didn't believe in the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were trying the whole time to please God by the works of the law. And that's why they stumbled, it says, at the stumbling stone. And he says, As is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. And look what he writes in verse 10. Brethren, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire. He says, it Deep down on my deepest core, to God, for Israel, is that they might be saved. Saved from what? Saved from their sins? Saved from the ignorance that is in them? He says, Hey, these guys, I can bear them record. I can testify on their behalf that they really are zealous about what God does. They have a zeal of God. But what? But they're ignorant. Not according to knowledge. And I'm going to tell you, that's most of church people, church-going people today. They have a zeal of God. I can bear them record. How do I bear them record? The same way the Apostle Paul bear Israel record. He was part of them. I was part of them. I was part of the churches. I knew I saw what they did. I knew what they did. And they were what? They were woefully ignorant. So it's not, it's not arrogant for me to say that. It's not pompous for me to say that. It's just like Paul's saying here. He's like, I bear him record just like I bear the church record today. That they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Why? Because they've only ever watched the movie. They never read the book. They never studied the book. I mean, ask any professor in the entire world, you know, which, is, which are the students? You know, Katie's a teacher. Which are the students that do well on the tests? The ones that study. The ones that take notes. Which are the ones that do poor on the test? Uh, the ones that know nothing, uh, the ones that sleep during class, you know, the ones that are playing on their phone, playing Angry Birds or Candy Crush, or whatever the latest craze is right now. But look what he writes here. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. This is what's important. God has a righteousness, can't be ignored. It's going to be demonstrated throughout all of eternity to those who don't believe in it. He says, in going about to establish their own righteousness, that's the dichotomy you got to see. Your righteousness as the things that you do good versus God's righteousness, they don't add up. He says, you have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, which is what? He says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. It's the end of the law for righteousness. That's how we, we don't have to look at the law as being the, 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 the righteousness. You follow me what I'm saying? We just saw a little bit ago that the end of the law is what? Christ is the end of the law. Remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we just read there that they couldn't steadfastly look to the end. Read there again if you see in verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 3. I mean, he says, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 13, And not as Moses which put a veil over his face, the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Right? Right here. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. When you're trying to find righteousness, you can't look at it in the law. You have to look to the end of the law to find the righteousness. And he says, For Moses described the righteousness which is in the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. And then he goes through and tells you about 
this issue about faith and, and how it's important for you to believe and, and believe that the biggest issue is what? That Christ is not dead, but he's alive and that he died for the sins of the world. You know, it's, it's a hard truth. This nation of Israel, they had trouble with this. Uh, they, they didn't really want to believe it. And it was, it's, it's partially the same problem the world has today. What is that problem? They don't think they have a problem, right? If, they, if you don't think you have a problem, you're not going to get it fixed. So what do you have to do? You got to show people that they have a problem. And so it's not a pompous thing. It's not an arrogance thing. We just, we just talked about there in 2 Corinthians that we do it in humility. Well, the way we do it, though, is we say, hey, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience. We're saying, hey, look at me. Do you think I'm trying to, am I trying to get anything out of you? Do I want to make any money from you? Do I want to get wealthy? No, none of that stuff. What am I trying to simply do? I want you to understand what I have and what I, what I possess, and that's truth, and it, and it helps me get through on a day-to-day -day basis. And I thought as I was talking to Russ today on the phone, I said, you know, what if I didn't have the truth of the scripture? I don't think this life would be worth living. I would be the most depressed person in the world. Where's the hope? What do you do? What do you wake up every day to do? I mean, I don't like my job that much. <laughs> you know, I don't think anybody does. Nobody wakes up every day and is like, man, my job is awesome. I love it so much. I love get up at 515 every day. You know, no. I love slaving away all day, watching other people make a dollar when I make one penny, you know? It's not, it's not what it's about. It's more than that. So what you do is you're able in that to have a ministry to help people out. And, it's, and, and you know what? Not everybody's going to believe the message. Look at 1 Corinthians with me. Chapter 1, and we'll, we'll close with this. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says this. 1 Corinthians 1 Verse number 18, Paul says, For the preaching of the cross, that's what I'm preaching. Remember we said we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, right? I'm not preaching Jason Tripp, I'm preaching Jesus Christ. He says, The preaching of the cross is to them which perish foolishness. So if you sit there and you think, if you're on the YouTube today and you're listening, and you say, This guy Jason is an absolute fool. Well, that's unfortunate because you perish. But if you say, hey, this stuff is great, this is the power of God, well, you're saved. Paul makes it very clear that the world has a wisdom that's not wise. He says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. He says, where is the wise? Where are those intellectuals? Where is the scribe? Where are those guys who write all those books? Where is the disputer of this world? Where is that philosopher? Hath God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now look at this verse. 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That's it. It's all he's looking for. He was looking for that with the nation of Israel all along. He said, will you believe me? No, we're not interested in believing you. But look at all the signs and wonders and miracles that Israel got from God. And they still didn't believe him. You know, it's sad, but as we continue to study out Romans 9, I think we'll be able to see and understand the, the, that, that God still has a plan for Israel, and that we'll see the truth that God has, has told them. He says, you know what, guys? I don't break my word. Even though you break your covenant, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, and we're going to go into that next week. So, all right, let's, uh, let's close in word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you.